to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus, who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts chapter 2, verse number 36. We welcome you today to the exciting and powerful study of the book of Acts. Acts is like no other book in the New Testament in that its design is to tell men and women how to become a Christian. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. If you don't have your Bible, we want you to pause for just a moment. Find your Bible as we're going to look to the Word of God today in our study of the wonderful book of Acts. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. If you've got a Bible question you'd like to know more about the plan of salvation or the church or any religious matter, you'll find people in God's church who'd be happy to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. And so visit the local Church of Christ in your area, whether it be for Sunday morning Bible study, worship, Sunday night, or Wednesday Bible study, you will find people there who love God, who are concerned about what the scriptures say, and who are kind and warm and inviting to visitors. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know more about God and His will. Check us out on our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material online free of charge. We have audio lessons, video lessons, all our past lessons. We put online study questions, transcripts. Just go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. If you'd like to have a copy today of our study on the book of Acts or any of our past studies, you can go to our website, fill out a free media request form. From that, you can select whether you want an audio CD, DVD, or a digital download, and we'll be happy to send that to you free of charge. And also, we want to encourage you in our fast-paced world where everybody seems to have a smartphone, check out the Gospel of Christ app in the respective Play stores. Great way to keep up with what we're doing and have access to all our lessons online. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, like our page, and we'll be glad to visit with you or communicate with you that way as well. Today we're thinking about the powerful book, the exciting, the action-packed, powerful book, the book of Acts. You see, what makes this such a great book is the Bible is a book of living messages. The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Hebrews 4, verse 12. And the book of Acts is such a powerful book in that it gives us real-life examples of how people became a Christian. You know, people can wonder, what must I do to become a Christian? What did people do in the New Testament? And friend, that's exactly what the book of Acts answers. Acts 16, verse 30 is probably the single of the 2,000 questions that are asked in the Bible, it is the single most important question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 2 verse 37, on the day of Pentecost, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And today we hope to answer from the scripture that question because that's exactly what the book of Acts is all about. Now, before we start our study in the book of Acts, let's set some other things in order that will help us to better understand this book. Let's put Acts in its proper place in the New Testament. There are four categories that are unique to the New Testament. The first category is what we would refer to as the gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the gospel accounts, and they tell us who Jesus was about his coming into the world, his teaching, his miracles, 
ultimately tell us about his death, burial, and resurrection as well. Then the book of Acts is that second category, and it tells one, now that you know about Jesus and what he did, here's how to become a follower of Christ. And so that second category, the book of Acts, here's what Jesus did, here's how to become a Christian. Then there's the third stanza in the New Testament, and that would be Romans, the books of Romans through Jude. And they would tell one, now that you are a Christian, here's how to live faithfully to the Lord. Romans through Jude is all about practical Christian living. And then that fourth and powerful stanza, the book of Revelation, tells one who is a Christian trying to live faithful to Jesus how to die victoriously in the Lord. Be faithful unto death. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. Now let's take just a moment to kind of talk about the purpose and how the book of Acts unfolds so that we can follow that pattern as we study this book. The book of Acts really has a threefold purpose. As we mentioned, the first and the major purpose in the book of Acts is to answer the question, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, verse 30 and 31. We see from Acts 2 to the end of the book that God is telling men and women by examples that we find what a person must do to be saved. And so if a person wants to learn how to become a Christian, Read the book of Acts, do what they did, and you will become a Christian. There's a second purpose to the book of Acts, though, and that is it tells us of the establishment of the Lord's church. You remember in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here today who will not taste death until they see the kingdom present with power. And so God said the kingdom's coming and it's going to be a powerful thing when it comes. We open to Acts chapter 2. Peter and the other disciples are there waiting. The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit falls upon them. They are able to speak with un, uh, other languages, unknown tongues, the Bible says. And the church of the Lord that day in Acts 2 is established. We know that. For the very first time in Acts 2, verse 47, after men and women have obeyed the gospel, the Bible says the Lord added to the church daily. Those are being saved. And so the church, the kingdom, is established in the book of Acts. Then there's kind of a, a supplementary purpose to the book of Acts, and this is really big for understanding the rest of the New Testament. The book of Acts is a history book and it is the background for many, if not all, of the rest of the letters in the New Testament. Let me illustrate. If you want to study the, the book of 1 Corinthians, where do you turn first? 1 Corinthians 1.1? 1, 1? No. You turn to Acts 18. If you want to study the epistle to the Ephesians, where is the first place to look? Ephesians 1? No. The first place to look is Acts 19, where we learn about the history, the background, and the church being set up. Uh, Galatia, Colossae, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, it, nearly every epistle that you will read from Romans through Jude, much of the background to understanding what was going on is found in the book of Acts. And so that's a big purpose in the book of Acts as well. Now, one other key detail that will really help us to better understand the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 kind of gives us a great outline of geographically how the gospel is going to be taken in the book of Acts. Open Acts chapter 1 and I want you to notice a, a good outline for the book in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. To the disciples who are told to wait in Jerusalem, the angels say this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and Jesus says, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And so we've got four geographic locations that the book of Acts tells us the gospel is going to go to. Jesus first says, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That begins in Acts chapter 1 and goes through chapter 3 at least and a little further into that. And so you've got Jerusalem, Acts chapter 1 through 3, 
Judea, and some of that begins in Acts chapter 2 when the gospel is preached and people obey that and they take it home with them to, to Judea. But in reality, Acts chapters 2 through 8, the gospel is now going to Judea, that region around Jerusalem spreading out a little further. Then Samaria, Acts chapter 8 through 12, Philip and others take Paul, takes the gospel to that region of Samaria. And then chapters 13 through chapter 28 and the uttermost part of the world. Paul, now by the power of the Holy Spirit, begins to preach in places the gospel has never gone and eventually will go with Paul all the way to Rome. And so that's a, a good outline. Acts 1 through 3, Jerusalem. Acts 2 through 8, Judea. Acts uh, uh, 12 through 13 or Acts 9 through 13, you've got it going to uh, Samaria and then chapters 13 through 28 as well to the rest or the uttermost part of the world. Now let's begin by thinking about the first four chapters. And in this study of the book of Acts, we're going to kind of take about three or four chapters a lesson and hit the highlights and see what lessons we can practically learn with these uh, principles in mind. And so let's begin in Acts chapter 1. What is it that after Jesus has been resurrected, what is it that he wants his disciples to be doing? Look in Acts chapter 1, and I want you to notice the context of what's happening. Look beginning in verse number 4. The Bible says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they'd come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the end or uttermost part of the earth. And so you can imagine as the disciples here with Jesus, he's about to be, uh, he's about to ascend back to the Father and they've got a question. You've been talking about the kingdom, Lord. Are you now going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said, wait, 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 you're kind of getting ahead of yourself. You don't worry about the times and when this is going to happen and when that's going to happen. Here's what you need to worry about. You'll be my witnesses in these areas. That's what I want you to do. You see, what's unique about Acts is where Luke 24 ends, Acts 1 begins. Jesus told them in Luke 24, go in Jerusalem and you'll receive power from on high. Wait there for it. And they're now in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1 and that's exactly what's happening. And so Jesus wants his disciples then and he wants us today to focus on what we need to focus on. My emphasis as a Christian, my emphasis as a follower of Christ is to spread the message of Jesus. You're going to be my witnesses in these areas, Jesus said. Now, I'm not a witness in that I was a firsthand accountant of what happened, but I'm convinced based on the message that it's true. And our privilege and responsibility as Christians is to spread that gospel. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel unto every creature, Jesus said. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. And so let's, let's let God worry about the things God needs to worry about. You know, sometimes people get all caught up in, when's this going to happen? And, when all, and when's the world? All these things. Stay focused on what we need to focus on, what we can control, trying to spread the gospel and do good in our communities. Now, as you may know, uh, the book of Acts kind of unfolds and tells the story of Judas. Uh, chapter 1, Judas, he denied the Lord. As you remember, he tr turned the Lord in. He turned to, a tra to be a traitor. Uh, Judas sold the Lord out for those 30 pieces of silver. As a result, he eventually felt remorseful. Instead of repenting and turning back to God, Judas felt sorry for what he did, and he went out and hanged himself. 
And so now, though among those 12 disciples, there is a seat untaken. And so God is going to fill that void, and two men are put forward, and they let God do the deciding. Well, how did God decide? And what does God know about us today? Well, friend, God decided because he knows the hearts of all men. Look in Acts chapter 1, verse number 24 with me, and notice what the Bible says about God knowing Matthias' hearts and ours as well. They prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. And of course, God chooses Matthias because God does know the hearts of all men. But isn't there a practical lesson there? God knows your heart. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. John 2, verse 25, God knows what's within a man. Proverbs 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. All things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Friend, I'm reminded at the outset of the book of Acts that I'm not, do not be deceived, God's not mocked. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. God knows our heart. God knows what's going on in our lives. God's able to help with that. But friend, let's not fool ourselves and think that we can hide from Almighty God. Now let's take just a moment and move forward to the, probably the premier chapter in all the Bible. Acts chapter 2 is such a pivotal chapter in the, in the New Testament, in the Bible itself. In fact, someone once said that Acts chapter 2 is the hub of the Bible. Everything before Acts chapter 2 has been working toward it. Everything after Acts chapter 2 is predicated upon what happens in Acts 2. Acts 2, 38, 6 is probably the climatic verse in all of Scripture. When Peter preaches about Jesus and brings it to a head and says, Therefore, that all the house of Israel know assuredly God's made this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. Friend, that is the fulfillment of God's scheme of redemption, no longer in, in, in planning and promise and prophecy, but as a reality, men and women can now access the blood of his son who died for all men's sins. And that's the pivotal moment in history and, of course, in the Bible. Now, in Acts chapter 2, what Peter does is in Acts chapter 2, you remember the Holy Spirit falls upon them. They're able to speak in unknown languages. Some people don't understand that, and so their response is, uh, these men are filled with new wine. Peter says, that's crazy. It's 9 a.m. in the morning. We are not filled with new wine. Nobody's had time to get filled with new, new wine, but here is what's happening. This is what the prophet Joel prophesied, and he quotes from Joel chapter 2, that God would cause his men servants, his maid servants, his spirit would fall upon them. Peter says, that's what's happening here, and here's what God's trying to do with that to get your attention. He shows that God was planned, that Jesus was planned by God. This is what God planned through the scriptures all along. He'll quote from the Psalms. He will quote from uh, David. He will quote from the prophets. He will show that this is not just what God planned, but this is what was prophesied, what he predetermined, and the, the, the miracles of Christ, the prophets line up with it. This is everything. David himself calls him Lord, Acts chapter 2, and he just point after point after point from their Old Testament shows this is what God had planned all along. And why did God plan this? What's it all about? To help people see that Jesus died for their sins. Peter will say, and listen to the personal nature of it now, at the climax of his sermon, in Acts 2 verse 36, Peter preaching and looking those Jews in the eye says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God's made this Jesus, now listen to the personal nature of it, whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. Friend, there has to be a, a, a personal response to the preaching of the gospel. By that I mean this. Every one of those people there knew they'd killed their own Messiah at this point. This is why they cried out. They're cut to the heart and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so there's a personal nature 
to hearing the message of the gospel. And friend, let's, let's make it just as personal today. I wasn't there when the Lord was killed. I did not cry out, crucify him, crucify him on, uh, during that first century. But he died for my sins and yours nonetheless. All have sinned, Romans 3.23. If all have sinned, I have sinned. He went to the cross for me and you just as much as he did on the first day of Pentecost. And when they cried out, men and brethren, they were cut to the heart. Peter told them exactly what to do. You see, my friend, these people had to obey God's word. They had to submit to the teaching of these inspired apostles of Christ. And so they cry out, many brethren, what shall we do? And the answer is clear. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Peter tells them, you're right. You've killed your Messiah. You need now to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Remission means removal. They had to change their way of thinking, which leads to a changed way of acting, and they had to be baptized to be forgiven of sin. Baptism is not something in the New Testament. Baptism is not something you do after your sins are forgiven, after you're already saved. In the Bible, baptism is for the forgiveness of sins, and it is essential to be saved. Now, that may be different than what you've heard, but listen to what the Bible actually says. Apart from Acts 2.38, Jesus said this, Repent, and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Uh, Mark 16, 16. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. That's what Jesus said. Listen to Acts 22, verse 16. Ananias is told, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Paul had to get up, Saul had to get up and have his sins washed away by being baptized. And listen to what Jesus said. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so as we mentioned, those people gladly received God's word. In Acts chapter 2, they were baptized. And for the first time ever, God added people to his kingdom, his church. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ was set up, was established, and came into existence on on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verse number 47. Now, Peter will continue this line of thinking in chapters 3 and 4 as well. As he stands before the Jews on Solomon's portico in Acts chapter 3, Peter again tells them about the Prince of Life. He tells them about this Jesus who they are guilty of crucifying, who they have sinned against. And he tells them what to do. Acts chapter 3, verse number 19 Peter says, repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And so these people realize they're in sin. What do we need to do? Repent and turn from your sin so that God can save you. And friend, God, in every account, God will tell people what to do. We take everything the Bible says on that, the totality of God's teaching. And we can know what men and women must do to be saved. And so there was a lame man in Acts chapter 3 that they healed. That caused a commotion. Peter stands up and preaches the gospel, tells them what they've got to do to obey God. And now based on that great miracle, it kind of caused a stir among the people. And that unfolds over into Acts chapter 4. This man who was lame was laid at the gate called Beautiful. Peter and John, he wanted money. Peter and John healed the man. He's jumped up. He's running around. Everybody knows this common beggar. And so it's a, there's a great stir. How did this man, who we've all seen, get healed? And so that's what they're going to ask Peter and John in Acts chapter 4. And Peter and John respond so beautifully. They ask in Acts 4 verse 7, By what power or by what authority? Have you done these? Who gave you the power? Who told you you could do it? And who gave you the ability to heal this man? And Peter takes that and with great joy tells them about salvation in Jesus. Acts chapter 4, 
Verse number 12, Peter tells them, This is the stone which you builders rejected. He is the one who gave us that authority. And then he says this, Nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Peter plainly helps these Jewish leaders, many of whom are hypocrites, to see Jesus He's the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. You cannot be saved outside of, you want to put all your hope in Moses, and you want to put all your hope in Abraham, and you want to put all your hope in the commandments and the teachings of these, uh, of these Jewish scribes and leaders. And Jesus said, and yet, and Peter said, and yet Jesus, he's the one. You left out of your plan. He's the only name by which you can be saved. And at that point, they realized these great men, these fishermen who weren't great scholars by their estimation, they realized they had been with Jesus. Acts 4 verse 13, and they realized we will either have to submit to Christ and do what he says, or we'll have to hush these men up. And that's what Acts chapter 4 and 5, they try to do just that. And so the, our initial introduction and the first four chapters in the book of Acts are filled with so much joy and excitement, such a pivotal part in the New Testament, but let's not miss that from a personal standpoint. In Acts 2, people were told when they realized they were in sin what God wanted them to do to be saved. Friend, have you realized what you've got to do if, if you're in sin and you've never obeyed the gospel? Remember, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Have you heard the message of Jesus? Do you believe he's the Son of God? Are you willing to repent and turn again, Acts 3, 19? Would you repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, verse 38? If you've never done that, don't miss the main message of Acts. What must a person do to be saved? We're so glad you joined us for our study today. Stay tuned next time, and we're going to discuss Acts chapter 5 through 8. Thank you for joining us today. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.